Oh, what a confusing time it is. Recent revelation shows that it turns out that for much of his time in office, Scott Morrison was more than just prime minister. He took on the powers of five additional portfolios. There are unconfirmed rumours that he may be the next bachelor or even the farmer wants a wife and two of the contestants. And this has all happened almost entirely in secret. Yesterday, Scott Morrison's confusing press conference and glaring inconsistencies have done little to reassure or elucidate on why this would possibly happen. Joining us on the Inform today to discuss it is victims of crime advocate, John Heron, and author of Blood Soaked Soil, Mario Beeks. Welcome, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Now, th this is just uh, unheard of stuff. Uh, five ministries being sworn into by the Governor General. The secrecy surrounding it seems to be the biggest um, tell with the Governor General keeping it to himself and himself just coming out and saying he assumed that the Prime Minister would make it public. Barnaby Joyce being uh, informed, but keeping it secret. And the ministers, I can't imagine what that says about their competency when Scott Morrison feels he needs to shadow them. Where does it all go? Well, um, let's say the first time I saw it released, I, I thought this was another distraction from the new government, but then that quickly dissipated by the, as you just said, the raw facts of, of secrecy. Um, and as it emerged more and more, you had the proverbial dig, dig yourself a hole when Morrison had a, a press conference yesterday. And, and that's exactly what transpired. It's just one word, secrecy. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that, John. And I, I was thinking it was just a, just a, just a, some type of the, of the glitching. I mean, the news. You know, when the, when I heard this, but then I was literally surprised to find out the prime minister and sworn on the five ministerial positions. And you know, the the question is how legal that it is because it seems to me that uh, nobody objecting legality of, the, of 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 the being sworn ministers. And we know that during the Scott Morrison government there were ministers on this portfolio. So like I still don't understand how's legally that even possible that the prime minister can be sworn and the governor general says it's not my job i'll read it today in newspapers it's not my job to talk about uh, who is sworn and why is sworn i mean it doesn't make a sense well from a legal point constitutional yeah. point of view the governor general just accepts the recommendations well let's say rubber stamps that what the prime minister's put to him yes. so he probably had no uh, reading his statement this morning didn't really um it wasn't his his role to question it. He's not another John Kerr that then rushes out to the steps of Parliament or, or not, um, and says that this is a bad thing. So he just went through and can confirmed. Um, he had no idea of the lack of publicity. So I don't think he's a major player in that. He's followed the, the protocol. So it's not illegal to come in and ask the Governor General to swear in ministers. If you have one minister resign and another one come up, you, you go to the Governor General. Uh, he gives it the seal, and, and away they go. And that happened. So I don't think that's the problem. I think. We, we wind back to the, the secrecy of it. Um, that's the, the real uh, problem there. And there's two other problems, but I want to highlight one, really, that, and it, this really hit my mind, it, it, it's exam, uh, an example of how the Morrison government uh, addressed the pandemic. You know, we're, we're very easy to stick the boot into uh, Victoria and, and Queensland and, and perhaps some other states in, in how they manage it. But that was that was his game plan. So no wonder the ship was 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 um, riding keel up uh, when the pandemic came along because it started with the federal governments. Like you know, again, vaccine lack of vaccines, um, letting the premiers do what they want, et cetera, et cetera, all that type of thing that wasn't evident in any other country, um, even Canada, and that's saying something. But. That's how he treated and ran the, the pan. Let's not forget that the pandemic. So he didn't have confidence in ministers and that type of thing. One thing, but um, he, he lashed out at the authoritarianism, say Andrews, but at the same time was doing just as bad. Yeah, that's 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 correct, my uh, Johnny. I agree on that one because now we can see why why Australia was a different, you know, from many other countries when it comes to pandemic. Maybe he didn't like it what the ministers. They're thinking and they want it. 
So he put the foot on. But again, that's a dual, the dual parallel, uh, uh, how to say, hierarchy of the power. You know, this is, this is for me unknown. You know? I mean, so like, what was the case? If minister decide one thing, he overruled and uh, write uh, different, different, you know, legislations. This, this is what I'm confused. If the ministers decide one thing and then he can overrule them because he's sworn secretly on that portfolio. This is, I'm... It's a bit. It's a bit like the last days of Constantinople. So there's Byzantine plots here and there and around every corner. That um, again, how how is he going to address this? Well, I'll I'll keep these ministers sidelined. I won't tell them. There's that lack of information, um, and he managed to keep a lid on it. It's probably surprising, um, and and actually credit to Alba Very for surprising, yeah. it and, and, Very surprising. and rolling it out there so that we can all see it forcing Morrison to bubble up in a press conference. And even then he couldn't justify it. So, I mean, we'll swirl around with all, with all these plots that are going around Canberra. And again, the other thing that comes to my mind is, is, is the, the dearth of leadership in across the entire country. And that goes for the experience of them. And as Mario alluded to, the ability to make decisions in, in difficult times, right? That's absence in, in both of these parties. Completely. Yeah. Morrison says that he never used uh, the powers and, and it was just a precautionary or preparatory um, measure that he took. But he actually did right. when he knocked the gas development on the head where he, over, he took control of That's that right. because he thought it would damage the uh, party's chances in the upcoming election. Yeah. If you've given someone a gun, and they're pointing it around. The fact is they either pulled the trigger or they didn't. The fact is they've got a gun in their hand and they can do it. Mm. I like it, this what you said, John. This is this is this is exactly correct. I have the gun, I will not pull the trigger. But so what does that mean? I didn't make a decision, it's only if I needed. I mean <laughs> now the, the prime minister isn't actually constitutionally uh recognized. He's meant to be the first among equals. What would happen? In the caucus, do you think if the prime minister who was uh, sworn as, in as the health minister disagreed with Greg Hunt, wh where would that go? Who who takes priority? Whose decision rules? Well, maybe again, like the fall of Constantinople, Constantinople, it would have fallen. The caucus would have fallen. So, um, it, you know, it reminds me of a day with with um, back years ago with the Tasmanian dams and the, and you had... Um, Bob Hawke floundering around. And I believe that Kim Beasley just hit the table and said to him, please just make a decision. All right. Because Hawke was known for like the consensus and cons on consensus. But maybe we, we got a little bit of that. But um, yeah, just, just keeping it secret and not being able to make a decision. Right. And again, the, another thing too, what does that tell you? Let's go into the management of, of Morrison. So that's what we call control freaks and 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 the inability to delegate a very key thing uh, about management is being able to delegate to your subordinates mario i'd know that as a military man that that that's actually crucial you know we have and we have in the australian i mean western army is good middle management there you you de delegate to them the fact is he couldn't do that shows that he was a very poor manager doing that yeah, but you're absolutely right, John, you know, when we talk about this thing, you know, what I've tried to understand, did he overrule the other ministers or not? You know what I mean? Because the decision making has been in the hands of the ministers and somehow we, we, we're hearing that they, nobody didn't know that he was a sworn in their portfolios. I mean, how much secrecy you can hold on that, on that, you know, so like this is for me mind blowing, you know, that nobody didn't know that he done what he did. Well, answer this question. You just write it's question on a question. So, yes, are we please. still any wiser now? Do we know? Do we know actually why it happened? The fact is, we don't know that even now after a press conference, and that's really worrying too. Which can be used in the future as well. It, it reminds me at the moment of that meme where Homer Simpson slowly drifting backwards <laughs> into the hedge. And, you no, know, and the, that's the distance between them. It, it also with our Westminster, Westminster system. One of the things about it is not having centralized power we're not a dictatorship but we like to think we're not and it's spread evenly those ministers hold responsibility for those those areas 
this also could leave open the reason we don't have this is for Morrison to be influenced, do favours for all of the all of the other things that you know. If we go to the the worst case scenario, <coughs> that in, in, enables those things as well, doesn't it? Yeah, without going. <laughs> Sorry, I was late. Yeah, have a look at Victoria. What you just described is the Andrews government. <laughs> yep. Um, that's, I was going to get to that, try and draw that parallel as well. <laughs> the main difference is Andrews feels emboldened and um, completely at ease in doing it in plain sight. When you look at the pandemic law bills where health minister, doesn't matter, it's up to him. Chief health officer, doesn't matter, up to him. Everything comes down to Andrews to make the decision. So exactly the same as what Morrison oh. did, but without the secrecy. Well, so which one do you prefer more, secrecy or no secrecy? Uh, uh, no secrecy about about Andrews, no. apart from the length that Andrews has gone to to obfuscate and hide the reasons why the decisions are made. We've seen their chief information officer come out damning. We've seen the ombudsman come out damning of the lengths and efforts that Andrews has put into keeping the information that he based his decisions on secret. So there is the secrecy. He's put his hand up and said, I'm going to do this and I am not going to explain why. I think the word accountability lost the, lost the, the, the importance and the, uh, the seriousness of that word accountability because what is proven in both cases, either with the ex-Prime Minister or with uh, Daniel Andrews, that doesn't matter what we believe or should be done legally. When the people take it, that opportunity to grab the power and control, you know, decision making on behalf of ministers or any other key players in, in the government, you know, the question is, where's accountability? Which that, what, that, what that means, that I can come to the John and say, I'm sorry, John, you know, like I take it all full responsibility for, you know, stealing all Ian Cook food, but, you know, that's, that's, that, that's it about, you know, I mean, that's, I'll not be punished. Yeah. This is what I'm, what, what I'm heading, you know, I mean, everybody loves to say, I take responsibility, I'm accountable, I'm this and that, but I, we can see, we can see it in recent events, past two years, that that word accountability, responsibility means really nothing literally nothing in politics nothing i think the difference there is that with morrison um so the, yes it was secret what's come out is that he did it but we haven't seen whether he took advantage of that power or used it so so we don't know if there was you know if he got a benefit if you like from that and in terms of accountability if it had come out and he was in power you'd expect him to resign as it is he's lost his job anyway so the public um, one way or another, have made him accountable, even though we didn't know it. The difference with Daniel Andrews is he's taken advantage of all these things, his power and his ability to back things back. And like you say, say, I'll take responsibility, but I'm actually not. I'm just going to use the words. You know, with the words. So the $13 million that the uh, Auditor General said that he spent that, it, that was illegal, apparently that was just an opinion. That's the Auditor General. I mean, that, that sort of thing, and then red shirts. Well, we'll just pay the money back. I've, I reckon there'd be a few armed robbers who wish they could have just paid the money back and avoided the 12 years jail. Oh, I love it how he said this, Ian. <laughs> it, the worrying thing too, the, the fallout here, is that we use that, we keep using that in Australian politics, the term, but they do it too, right? So straight away, what uh, you can see this emerging is if, if, um, you, could, you could hear the Labor caucus probably say, well, let's have a shot at this. You know, they, they're very emboldened with um, draconian rules and measures, et cetera, as we've seen. But it, it could potentially lead... They're not the party that turns around and go, we're, we're squeaky clean, look at him over there. It's, yes. it, it is, well, they did it. Uh, if we get caught yeah. doing it, well, they did it. That's it. You know what, John? When uh, when we have people, even like Ryan, when he comes on, you know, and they don't like the rise of the independence, the problem is this, is that there is a growing section of the electorate that is sitting there saying, a pox on both your houses. I'm going to vote for an independent. I'm going to vote for someone new or someone who I believe isn't corrupted by a party machinery, whichever side of politics. Now, personally, 
I think that there are more straight people on the conservative side of politics than on the left. The problem I have with the left isn't that, in fact, I don't, the ideals of the Labor Party, looking after the vulnerable, helping the workers, I don't have any problem at all with all of that, and I agree with heaps of it. What I disagree with is the control that the leader and the, um, and the, and the caucus has. If you say anything against their ideas, you're out. If you happen to speak publicly about it, not only are you, you're out, ostracised and punished in any way they can come, they can think of. Yeah, that, that's right. I think, um, look, a lesson I saw from the last election was the people really didn't have a lot of choice. So generally, that, that's a creeping situation in Australia where people tend to vote parties out. They're not voting good people in been a long time anywhere that 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 someone has has gained power on on a popular upswing because they were good right you might have had like a kevin run he got an ups, upswing because um no one knew about him and he went under the radar and then when he's in power they found out what he was but there's no one genuine i can't think of anyone in in decades federal or state federal election people i saw them at the polling booth they didn't want to vote for anyone if you if we had non-voluntary um we've had voluntary voting uh more than half wouldn't have turned up for good reason and the other thing too preferential voting got this mob into power on 31 percent victoria looming victorian election it's already emerging now i can see that people are going i don't want to vote for andrews and i don't want to vote for the other one either we, yeah. we're, we're absolutely dearth for choice but the, the system we're locked into will, will ensure that one gets in or the other and and ugh, I'm sure 80 percent of the population that are not on government payrolls don't want that. No, I agree with you. And I think I think in Victoria, um, what we're going to see at, at, at this coming election is just that. It'll be what is it that what people will be thinking about the lesser of two evils. Um, and if we didn't have preferential voting, it would be in fact, if we didn't have preferential voting, Labor would struggle. Their primary vote's never as good as the Conservatives. That they know that in their research that their vote would collapse, right? A little schism into that is at university elections, right? Where you yeah. get about five to seven percent voting. <laughs> so you get in, you get the left wing or the or the, the far far left in or the right right in, but you don't get a mainstream because people don't turn up to vote, right? So um look, there are there are certain authoritarian regimes where like Pinochet, he might have he might have ran an election. All, all people could do is boycott it so that only 40, 50% voted. Right? That, that's an interesting phenomenon. Would Australians do that? They're just not politically motivated. So they'll trudge along on election day. Um, they don't even get a sausage um, sizzle now at the polling booths. <laughs> <But, laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of the preferential system, but what I'm not a fan of is the group voting um, system we have in Victoria. And there's a reason why Andrews refused to do the reform beforehand, because as John just said, they know exactly what's going to happen. But the preferential one is a good system, especially when it's compulsory. So you walk into the restaurant, you look up and go, I'll have the steak. The waitress will say, sorry, we don't have the snake. Fine, give me the schnitzel. Oh, sorry, we don't have the schnitzel. Oh, I'll go the toast. Sorry, don't have the toasted sandwich. Oh, what about the soup? Yes, we have the soup. So your vote counts. So it's, I mightn't get what I want, but at least I get some say in what I don't want. But this group voting ticket and the way that it's um, used is basically you walk into the restaurant and you say, I'll have the steak and they deliver you a shit sandwich and they go, mate, bad luck because <laughs> you've got no control where your preference goes. The parties control it and they do horse trading. Which... Uh, I'd, I'd say oh, yeah. that with, 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 uh, with the prep having in the election, I noted that um, I might have preference one group. So I had the highest in my electorate where 80% uh, preferences flowed to the Liberal Party. But there were other ones that did the same thing and only 50%. So people are not following that. They, they have to fill out the ticket. Just remember that we talked about the French election some time ago. Right? So basically it, it's it's voluntary and you had you go fight to the final preferential. But the point being the Republicans, again, like the Liberal Party, they're on the nose. People didn't tick that box. So they had 5% of the vote, right? Now, if you had had that last time around, you might have had the Labor Party, even if it was like where it is now, you might have had them on 15% of the vote. 
Mm. Right? And and so that, that's what people's vote counted in the French election. It doesn't count here. It's, it's not really one person, one vote democracy. Again, my, my view is multi-member proportional, but like New Zealand, but bridge too far. You know, John, the, the, the problem I have at the moment with, um, with politics in Victoria is, okay, we have a weak opposition and they were decimated at the last election, but we've now seen that this guy, when he got control, is about as corrupt as any politician that in my living memory of, of what I've heard. And, you know, to a degree, we put up with a certain amount of, um, of what we expect in politics. But literally, I, I have just finished reading the, the Electoral Act that was changed by him in 18. How the hell there wasn't more media about this is beyond me. It, it is... It is almost impossible for anyone really to generate a, enough money for a good campaign. The maximum amount anyone can give with indexation now to any one candidate is four thousand three hundred dollars in four years. When you give it, when the candidate, when someone gives that to a candidate, the candidate has to give, tell the um, electoral commission that they got it and who the person was. The person themselves, within twenty-one days, has to send a return in and tell the, tell the Electoral Commission. And then there's a list made of all these people that are given $4,300. And the next thing you know, um, if you give under $50, then that's, uh, what do you call it, then, then that doesn't count. Um, and can you hear me still? Yep. I'm sorry, Michael, my, my thing went funny. Anyway, so you, you've got this. Now, if that applied across the board to all candidates, it may force us back into town hall meetings and that sort of thing, which, which is grassroots, which I'm, not, which I'm not averse to. The problem I have is the Labor Party are allowed to take any amount of money from the union movement as an affiliate organisation. Mm. It, it, it is the most one-sided piece of legislation that I have ever seen. And when I inquired from people uh, who supposedly know, I said, how did this get through? I mean, I didn't even hear about it. And I was told it got through because he horse traded with those groups in the upper house you're talking about. The alleged and independence. That, yeah. Michael and I, I talked think, about this prior to the show because I encountered that at the last election with fundraising. I just couldn't raise funds. I, I was out of pocket myself. I knew other independent candidates that were out, out of pocket $20,000, $30,000. Um, we couldn't raise that amount of money because the type of donor uh, couldn't go beyond that amount, and then mum and dad really couldn't make up the shortfall. So, so that that's interesting because that that makes it uh, the only ones that can really stand now, as you said, are, are affiliate um, labour movements or someone with deep pockets like a teal, right? That's yeah, what you're limited yeah. to. Let that's Michael right. have it have. Tell but us what but on, only federally. But we've also seen the Victorians Party just withdraw uh, days ago because of this exact reason that Ian mentioned. Now, they've got backing. They've, they've got some wealthy uh, backers, but they can't get it in because they can't make that donation of more than 4,000. They have some really um, motivated and philanthropic backers that wanted them to do well. And because of these laws that have been designed, as Ian said, to, to keep everyone out, it's exactly why they've withdrawn. You think about it, for the average candidate to go out, do, you know, print your, print your flyers, print your how to vote cards, um, print your boards to go in fronts of houses, et cetera, do some advertising, mobile advertising around your electorate, Get into the local paper to and and you know take a page so you can write what your um, what you intend doing for the electorate and what you intend doing when you get into um, office if you do. I mean, you, you're going to spend what 120 to 150 grand. I mean, whoever came up with this 4,300 specifically wanted to isolate a uh, huge percentage of the population from having a voice. They probably got. Um... Uh, what's the, the Lowry Institute or another one to do modelling on that $4,300 figure? Who was the modeller in the pandemic? Uh, Burnett. Yeah. Burnett, Burnett yeah. yeah. They probably got Burnett to come up with uh, that amount. Uh, this is the optimal amount to exclude everyone to get you back into power, Ripper. Mm. All right, guys, yeah. we've got to leave it there. I've, I've, I've got to fly. <laughs> with our next one's in America, so I've, I've got to hit the yeah. window. 
But thanks yeah. again, and we'll all chime in again next week. And watch, I'm going to make a tip. Scott Morrison will be the next coach at Essendon. You heard it first here. <laughs> what? Look, <laughs> thanks, guys. See you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.